Well, good morning. Welcome to Central Online. My name is Matt Dumas. Great to see you guys this morning. Now, way back when, a, a long time ago in a land far away, this was uh, back in my early teen years. Um, this is sometime, if you were here last week, after I punched my brother in the mouth, and, and two weeks ago when I talked about my job at the movie theater, during that time, when I was about 12 are 13 years old. Um, my dad, I started working with him out in with uh, his business out in the oil fields of Central Texas. Every Saturday morning during the school year, every Monday through Saturday during the summers, uh, my dad would get me up around 6 a.m. and we would go to work and, and we would finish up about 6 p.m. It was hard work, it was physical work, but in addition to giving me a little money in my pockets, it was also uh, good for building muscle. And that was fun, especially the summers uh, before I played football in the fall, because I always looked like I worked out all summer. And, and for me, my natural workout kind of gave me this attitude that going to the gym was, I won't say for sissies, because I might get in trouble there, um, that, that it was for people who didn't have real jobs, where they worked with their hands and they built muscle that way. Well, that all changed when I got the job at the movie theater. You see, all of a sudden, uh, instead of doing this hard manual labor, this was kind of my job, tearing tickets and serving popcorn. And, and all of a sudden, I found that, that uh, what was building bigger muscles was now I was starting to shrink a little bit. My arms and my legs were getting a little smaller. My, a, a word that I started using with my boys at the gym this summer is my girth started to grow just a little bit more. And finally, I got to the point where I said, I got to do something about this. This is, this is kind of getting out of hand. So I tried a few at-home exercises, and, and those were eh, okay. But I finally joined a gym uh, in my early years of, of college. It was a small town Texas gym, no frills at all. Uh, but I began kind of going through the motions of working out. And, and at that time, I didn't think anything about training. It was just exercise to kind of try to keep everything status quo and maybe get in shape. Well, that all changed when I moved to California. Shortly after I got out here, I met a guy, and this was his phrase, what I remember him first telling me this. He said, your arms can never be too big, and you can never have too much money. Now, that was quite a poetic and, and a profound quote that Myron gave me, but uh, I thought, okay. And he invited me to, to train, he called it training, with he and his partner at the time. And I thought, okay, well, I've never thought of this thing as training, but okay. And shortly after, that was about six and a half years ago, Meyer and I started training together. Um, I found I got what he called the iron bug, which means that I, I found I loved lifting weights. And I loved lifting heavy weights. I, I like bench press and I like squats and I like deadlifts. Those are probably my favorite are the deadlifts. Um, I think in a moment we're going to have a little video. But here's the thing that I found when I started working out with Myron. Having the right partner makes all the difference, right? That, that, that I love the feel of heavy weights. I love the, the sound of them clanging together, but there was nothing that could beat the camaraderie of having a good workout partner. Uh, watch this video, this short clip. There you go. Good job, Myron. There we go. One more. Yeah. You got it. Okay, one more. You got it. Come on, pull. Ah. Yep. Good job.
Okay, at some point that just starts showing off, and I, that really wasn't the intent of the video. It was really what I wanted you to see from that is that Myron and I, when we work out together, it, it really is a team sport for us, that we encourage each other, and that uh, actually, if you heard it, he said three more. Well, I thought it was only supposed to be two, and so he pushed me to do one extra one in that whole set. But the thing I want you to know, again, is the importance of having the right partner, and so today, as we continue in the book of Romans, we're going to find Paul encouraging us and telling us that we have the absolute right partner in the Spirit. Please turn to Romans chapter 8, and let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today and just for the opportunity to, to spend time in your word, Father, to spend time worshiping you, spend time reflecting on all that Jesus has done for us. It's so easy in our world today with, with all of the voices clamoring for attention and all of the, uh, just the craziness of a pandemic and being locked down and, and the frustrations that are, that are arising in this country to forget who we are in Jesus. And that is the thing that defines us above everything else, above color or creed or uh, constituency or wherever we might be that Lord that the fact that we are your sons and daughters that is the thing that matters the absolute most and so father as we look at your word today I pray that we might be encouraged that we might be inspired that we might be spurred on to love and good deeds to live different kind of lives because of what you've done for us when we pray these things in Jesus name amen let's take a look at verse 1 Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an, and as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Last week, we saw that a battle rages within every believer. It's a battle between the law of God and the law of sin. A battle between the law of my mind or my heart and, the, and of my body. A battle between who I once was and who I am today. And though we wish it were otherwise, while we live in the already not yet time, that in-between time of, of who we are ontologically, who we are at the core of who our being and who we are experientially, we, we should expect that battle to continue. And while we could respond by giving up or giving in, Paul has already warned us that we are a slave of the one we obey. Paul asked a question at the end of Romans 7. He said, who will set me free from the body of this death? His response there was, uh, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, of course, the one who sets us free from the body of death is Jesus. That's the answer to the question, who will set us free? Paul has already made a compelling case for the utterly awesome and incomparable benefits of being in Jesus. If you think about it, if you went all the way back to the, the end of Romans 3 and you fast forward, you went through it, you would see that you're forgiven, you're justified, that you're made righteous, that you're reconciled, you're at peace with God, that you are free from the bondage of sin, that you are no longer under the law. That, that you now have Jesus' righteousness. You are now alive. So why, I wonder, does he say, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? It seems like condemnation would fall under that judgment category, that justice righteousness category. And so if we've already been justified, we've already been declared righteous, then why would Paul have to say you, you're no longer condemned? And here's why. You said we, said that we said this before, but it's worth repeating. Being in Jesus, there are things that are true of us at the ontological level. We are not who we used to be. There has been a shift from death to life, 
from wicked to righteous, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the sun. All those things that we mentioned are true of us, who, who we, of who we are at the core, but being in Jesus. Our, we, our ledger is wiped clean. Sin has been fully paid for, right? The death that sin required has been taken off the table. It's been fully satisfied. We are no longer under God's wrath, but we have peace with him all because of Jesus. Condemnation in a legal sense means that that's, uh, condemnation is the, either the, the judgment for sin, the, the, the bringing down, the passing judgment. Here's the sentence that you're going to have to carry out, or it's the actual sentence being carried out. Definitely wouldn't seem to apply to someone who is in Jesus, who has already escaped wrath. And yet Paul, who is no doubt, and Jesus can cry out, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? So while all of those things are true about folks who are in Jesus, Paul reminds us in Romans 7 that there is still a real battle that, that wages within every believer. It's part of the already not yet life that we live right now. And though we may struggle with sin, we are no longer under the penalty of sin. That sin's penalty has been taken care of. It's easy to lose sight of that in the midst of the battle. And even though the victory is secured, even though the, the war, right? Not the battle, but the war is already being won, right? That Jesus defeated sin and death at the cross. That that's already taken care of. Even though that's true, it sure may not feel like it. So Paul reminds us there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And as he's done throughout Romans, he's going to make this, this comparison. He's going to talk about the, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus versus the law of sin and death. Very similar to the, the law of God he talked about at the end of Romans 7 and the law of sin. Paul begins with a comparison the comparison with the mention of the law, right? The law that he's already said is holy and righteous and good. The law that reveals the character of God, the law that was given not to an unbelieving people so that they might be saved, but the law that was given to a believing people who are already saved. And yet it's the same law, right? That because of the weakness of our flesh, it's, it's the same law that sin has used to deceive and to kill us. It's the same law that, that sin has used to entrap us, to, to draw us in when we're unsuspecting. The law that awakened sinful passions and fostered self-righteousness, not because of a defect in the law. The law is not the problem. Sin is the problem. The law was given so that by faith, a person who believed might experience life as God designed it, right? The joy of obedience, delighting in the law of God, um, dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness, all those things that the psalmist talks about, the benefits of the law. But see, here's the thing with the law, if you think about it. The law was an input from the outside. Right, The law was something on the outside looking in. And I could read the law and I could study the law. And here's the thing, I could, the law could tell me what to do, but the law couldn't make me do it. The law didn't provide the internal motivation. It was external to me, so it couldn't provide the internal motivation that it took to follow the law. So it was weakened again, not because the law was defective, but because we are. In our humanness, our fallenness, our minds and our bodies that were fatally impacted by the fall, we could not live up to God's standard of righteousness. And since we couldn't, God did. I think that's probably one of the, the, the most striking statements in that little section. God did, right? What we couldn't do, God did. He sent Jesus in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now, Paul's careful when he says this, when he says likeness of sinful flesh, because he doesn't want to give you the impression that Jesus wasn't really a person, 
that he wasn't fully man. He wants to say that Jesus was flesh and blood, just like us, that he walked around on this planet just as we did. He wants to be careful that we understand that Jesus was fully man. But he also wants us to understand he was not like us in this way. He had no sin. Right? So on, on one hand, he's fully man, but, but on the other, he is a sinless man. Because only a sinless sacrifice, only a perfect sacrifice could qualify as a sin offering. And by his sacrificial death on the cross, Jesus condemned sin in the flesh. That means that Jesus passed judgment on sin. That he said that sin, you are going to die. He sentenced it to death. And because Jesus lived a perfectly sinless life, because he was and is truly righteous, because all his behavior was righteous, right? Everything he did was the right thing to do in that moment because he perfectly fulfilled the law and we are in Jesus. Guess what? Somehow and in some way, we have perfectly fulfilled the law. Just as in somehow, in some way, we participated with him in his death and resurrection, somehow and in some way, we have now fully fu fulfilled the law, somehow and in some way. Let's take a look at verse 5. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit... For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is death because of sin, yet the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And so the contrast begins, right? The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus versus the law of sin and death. Or you could call it the, the spirit versus the flesh. Now, here's something important to keep in mind here. As Paul's going through this little section here, he's not talking about two natures within a person and that you have this battle back and forth going between these two natures. He's talking about two different realms, two different kingdoms, two different spheres of life. Um, he's, he's saying you are either in Jesus or you are in Adam. You are not here in the middle going, I can straddle both. You are either in Jesus or you are in Adam. If you are in Jesus, you are according to the, the Spirit. In Jesus, you are according to the Spirit. If you're in Adam, you are according to the flesh. Now, that doesn't mean that a person who is uh, according to the Spirit can't live, right? That word walk. When it's a biblical term, means how you live. Can't live like they're according to the flesh at times. But from an ontological, again, that big word, from the kingdom that you, uh, your address is from, you, you are in Jesus. You are according to the Spirit. So now you are either according to the Spirit or according to the flesh. Those who have trusted in Jesus... Are according to the spirit. Those who have not are according to the flesh. If you are trusted in Jesus, you are no longer in this realm, you're in this realm. Right? So what's true of the person who, who is still in the realm of the flesh? What's true of the person who is still in Adam? What's true of the person over here? Paul says that his, he, he, he is a, um, they set their mind on the things of the flesh. The mind here is not just, hold on just a second. Yes. The mind here is not just the thoughts, but it's your way of life. 
So think about mind as it's kind of the direction you're going in. It's all of it encompassed together. It's my thoughts, it's my feelings, it's my worldview. It's everything about me. My, my mind is set on the things of the flesh. But what are the things of the flesh? I'm sure you don't have to ask that, right? If you go um, turn on the TV and you were just to, to watch whatever came on cable. You're to go to Netflix, look at your, your, your cue, what you're about to watch there. If you're to go on a social media and you're to see what the latest gossip is or what the latest kind of whatever controversy that's going on, if you're to follow uh, the regular media, if you're to listen to a news feed, everything in our culture, just about everything that is in our culture today, Right? Uh, Jesus said this about the person who's, who's trusted in him, but the, the, their seed has fallen into thorns. He says that the worries and riches and pleasures of this life, we might call it uh, sex and, and power and, and greed and materialism and, and everything else that goes under that umbrella. It's everything that's against God. It's everything that's antagonistic against him. It's death in its, in its purest form. And those who were according to the flesh were told that, that they can't even follow God's rules. They don't even have the ability to. They don't want to, and they can't. It's impossible for them. And that means that they cannot please God. What's true of the person who is according to the Spirit? Well, they set their mind on the things of the Spirit. And you might ask, well, what are the things of the Spirit? Crack open your Bible and start reading. What's according to the Spirit? We know the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The things that our culture, that's foreign to our culture, those are the things of the Spirit. It's life and it's peace. So which one of those describes you? Let me just say it this way. Paul makes it very simple for us. He, he says that if you are according to the Spirit, here's what we know about you. The Spirit dwells in you. If you have trusted in Jesus, if you are a believer, the Spirit dwells in you. You are in Jesus. You are according to the Spirit. If you don't have the Spirit, now this isn't talking about some kind of second blessing or any of that kind of stuff. This is talking about when you trust in Jesus, the Spirit is given to you at that moment. If you do not have the Spirit, then Paul says, you are not of him. He says that you are still in Adam. That you are still under God's wrath. That if you do not have the spirit of God dwelling in you, then you don't belong to him. No matter how many times you go to church, no matter how much money you give, no matter how nice you are to your neighbor, how good a person you are, you are not in him. And if you have questions about that, if you are wrestling with that, you can go to our live ch chat on our website, uh, centralchristian.org. There's a box at the bottom that someone would love to talk to you more about that. To the list of utterly awesome and incomparable benefits of being in Jesus, we can add, have the Spirit. Right, The Spirit of God or the Spirit of Christ, it, it, Paul's, uh, when he does that, he's alluding to the fact that the Spirit, who is uh, the, the Holy Spirit, right? That, that he's the Spirit of God, he's the Spirit of Christ, that he's one of the three, but that also means that Jesus is one of the three. That Jesus is not only fully man, but he's also fully God. And though our physical bodies have been heavily impacted by the fall and are susceptible to sin, one day... Oh, well, let me say it this way. Though our, our bodies are subject to the fall, they've been heavily impacted by sin, and one day these bodies will die. These physical, mortal bodies will die. We can see it more and more every day as you look in the mirror. The spirit who indwells us is life. 
Right, I think about in Genesis chapter 1 when it talks about the spirit hovering over the surface of the deep or in Genesis 2 where, where God forms man from dust to the ground and whew, he breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. Or, or in Ezekiel when, when you have the valley of dry bones and, and those bones come together and, and God asks Ezekiel, can these bones live? And he says, God, you know, and he, and he sends the, the spirit, the spirit who is life, and he breathes on those bones and they begin to live again and just as he raised Jesus from the dead the spirit will also raise us from the dead and give life to our mortal bodies which means that the bodies that we get our new resurrection bodies it's not like Lazarus who was resuscitated and died again but we will have bodies that are subject to death with no more that these mortal bodies then will become immortal Paul says that death will be swallowed up by life. I am looking forward to that one. Let's take a look at verse 12. So then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are ch children of God, and if children heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Based on all that Paul has said so far, all the extraordinary truths of what it means to be in Jesus, that we are fundamentally not who we used to be, Paul says this, because of all of these things right here, we should, right? We are under obligation to live a different kind of life. Because of all that's true of us now, why would we go back to living the, uh, the old life, the in Adam life? The according to the flesh life. It doesn't make sense. You see, that's not who you are anymore. You are no longer that person. And that kind of lifestyle only leads to death. Now, what does he mean by death here? At a minimum, what he means is you're not going to experience life that God saved you for. You're not going to experience the abundant life, the joy-filled life. You're not going to experience eternal life right here and now. At a minimum, it means that, that you give up a lot of the benefits of what it means to live for Jesus right now. And you have to experience death, a living death right now. Choosing to live our life in Jesus doesn't mean that the struggle is over. In some ways, it's just getting heated up. But the encouraging thing is this, the really awesome thing, you are not alone. And this is the thing, the whole video or whatever, but, but here's the thing that, that, that's the amazing part of this thing that the Old Testament believer didn't have. And Paul is so blown away because as Abraham was trudging along and he was following God, and as David was trudging along and he was following God, he didn't have the spirit dwelling in him the same way we do. And so Paul is so blown away that we would have the spirit who is right there with us, the spirit who is dwelling in us, the spirit who puts to death the deeds of the body. You see, we don't do that in our own strength, but his. And if we do that, if we put to death the deeds of the body, if, the, if we allow the spirit to do that in our lives, and we have a part to play, right? There's a divine partnership. Paul has already said, you got to make the choice. Which one are you going to do? Are you going to be a slave of sin or a slave of obedience? But when we make this choice, the spirit empowers us, and, and he helps us to put to, day, to death those deeds of the body, and now we have a different kind of life that we're living. He says, now you begin to live. And what does he mean by that? Well, you begin to live the life that God saved you for. The abundant life, the joy-filled life, right? You, you begin to live the eternal life that is here and now and then life. 
And if all of that wasn't enough, Paul hits us with a final benefit of being in Jesus. We are sons and daughters of God. Echoing the Exodus adventures of the children of Israel, we have been adopted into God's family. We've been made heirs. And incredibly, not only are we heirs of God, he says we are fellow heirs with Jesus, that we're walking shoulder to shoulder with Jesus. Instead of slavery and fear, we have adoption and the love of a father, of the father. And as heirs, the kingdom is assured. The spirit himself testifies to our spirit. One last thing that Paul mentioned, suffering before glory. And Paul knew a little bit about suffering. We, we talked about his Acts adventures when we were going through the book of Acts. But he knew what it meant to suffer for his faith. And he wrote to the, the folks, in, 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 or he, he told the folks there at the end of his first missionary journey, Acts 14, he says, it's through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And not only did Paul know about suffering, his Savior knew about suffering, as did every person who chose to follow God from the time that Cain slew Abel all the way to the present day. That Jesus said, if the world hates you, know that it hated me first. Right? If you were from the world, if you were of the world, if you were in Adam, the world would love you because it loves its own. But because I chose you out of the world, because you are now in Jesus, the world hates you. Right? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this, Blessed are those who are persecuted for the cause of righteousness. Right? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Right? But please don't miss the most important part of that equation. If we take serious our obligation to follow Jesus, we will suffer. No doubt. But Paul says we will also share in his glory. And it may not seem like it now, but that will be make it all worthwhile. In the war against sin, we've been given an ally who is truly, as my son would say, OP. He is overpowered. The spirit who is life and peace puts to death the deeds of the body when we rely on him. The spirit also testifies to our spirit that we belong to God, that we are sons and daughters of the king. We've been adopted into his family. If you've trusted in Jesus, choose to live your life, your identity in him. Right? So much now is true about you that we've seen from the book of Romans. So much is true. Again, we could go down that list of being forgiven, being justified, declared righteous, made alive. We've been reconciled to God, so we're at peace with him now. We have hope, right? Because uh, we have a sure hope. We have his love poured out in our hearts through his spirit. We have a new heart. We, we've been freed from sin, and, and we're no longer under the, the obligations of the law in the sense of an external master. We've been given the spirit. We've been adopted into God's family. We are now heirs with Jesus. So I wonder what it would look like to live your life based on those truths. I wonder what it would look like if you really took that seriously. If when you looked at yourself in the mirror every morning before you left your house or before you had a conversation with anybody else or you, you checked your email or your social media feed or anything else, if before you did any of that, you looked at yourself in the mirror and you said, you know what, this is what's true of me. I am a son or a daughter of the king. What would it, how would it change the, your outlook on life that day? The interactions that you have with people. How would it change what you're about to type? On your Twitter or Instagram or whatever, you name it, social media feed. What would happen if before you typed that, before you blasted someone or before you commented on somebody else's post, what would happen if you took a step back and you said, you know what, as a son or a daughter of a king, how should I behave myself? What would that look like for me to live a different kind of life? 
Am I marked by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control? If I exercise those things and I said, okay, now let me respond or now let me post. Let me see somebody else, not to be for the color of their skin and not for their creed or who they're voting for or any of those things. Let me see them as a person made in the image of God who desperately needs Jesus. And if that was my motivation when I went on social media, I wonder how that would change everything. You see, the world wants you to believe that we're all at each other's throats. The world wants you to believe that that the church is no different than they are. Let's prove them wrong. Let the things that you say and do, let the the way you present yourself and the way that you interact, let it show that you belong to someone else. That you've been adopted into the family, that you are a child of God. Let that be the thing that's known about you. Let that be the thing that they comment on. Let that be the thing that drives them to Jesus. But you have to make the conscious choice to do that. You have to choose to live out the reality of being in Jesus. You have to train yourself, discipline yourself. You have to get up in the mornings when it's not fun and it's cold outside. And you have to get down there and you have to grab the bar and you have to lift it up. You have to get in there and you have to say yes to Jesus and no to sin. You have to do it. But the beautiful thing in all that, you don't have to do it alone. You have the greatest partner ever to help you live out the Christian life, the Spirit. If you have not yet trusted in Jesus, if you are still in Adam, if you've heard everything you say, well, you know, I look at my life and I see more of the, the, the according to the flesh that's true of me, and I don't know that I have the Spirit in my life. I, I don't see the evidence of His work in me. If you want to trust in Jesus... You can either send us an email at connect at centralchristian.org or you can go to our live chat on our website and someone would love to talk to you about it. They'd love to talk to you about what it means to, uh, to, to trust in Jesus and get connected here. They would love to help you get um, to, to answer any question that you have. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much once again for the way that you love us, Father, the way that you care for us. The amazing benefits of what it means to be in Jesus. That we've been given your spirit, we've been adopted into your family. And though that we will struggle in this life for sure, that every time we say yes to Jesus, the spirit empowers us to do that. And he empowers us then to say no to sin, to put to death the deeds of the body so that we might experience life as you designed it. Not a perfect life as far as this world goes. We won't have all the money that we want and all the, all the fame and fortune, all that, but we'll have the life that you designed us for, the life that you've called us to, the life that you saved us for, a life of contentment and peace, a, a life of joy, a life that exudes love, a life that is others-focused, a life of adventure and excitement, a full and a rich life. And Father, I pray that we would, would live that kind of life this week. Lord, I pray for each person before they ever type in a comment, before they send send a post or reply to a post or anything like that, before they have a conversation with a friend over the phone or send a text or, or before they interact with their spouse or their kids in the morning, before they do anything else, they would spend time with you and that they would remind themselves of who they are. And that they would have grateful and thankful hearts and that that would impact the way that they live their life that day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.